Market reverses last week gains to fall 1% except for IT and PSU banks. All sectoral indices end in the red for this week. Hello and welcome to this a new edition of Editor's Roundtable. We take stock of the market action. We tell you why FBIs continue to remain big sellers in the month of October. We'll go through the big EPS earnings upgrades and downgrades so far. We'll put the spotlight on the tech sector's outperformance and we'll decode trend and page industry second quarter numbers. Action packed show. I'm Reema Tendulkar. With me, Prashant Nigel Manglam. Hi guys, and joining us on the show, we've got a special guest, Shiv Puri, founder and MD of TBF Capital Advisors. Hi. We're going to rain all questions to Shiv there, yeah. because he's the FI who's been selling. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, Shiv, coming to you, but I think it's been a, it's been a, what, tiring week? Friday fatigue? How can you start all every <laughs> editor's roundtable by saying <laughs> exhausted? I'm pumped Tired. up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward to the weekend. You know why? Because the next week is a truncated one. We and have the one a long after. weekend. The one after that, excuse me, just told us that it's a responsible truncated week. You have to go vote. It, and at least for us, all of us here in Maharashtra, November 20th, so stock markets are shut. So it's a, so voting is on the 20th, right? Voting is on the 20th. So it's not a Friday so or a Monday. It's not a Friday. Oh, oh, that's right. That's so that's in case you're planning to, you know, take no. uh, one of those sandwich holidays, then 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Well, not for voting. Not for voting. Not Never for voting. voting. Right? Well, that, that was the other cue, right, that we were watching. That's going to be the Maharashtra state elections and we'll wait by for the outcome. But today, we had, uh, this week, we had two big cues that yeah. played out. Uh, Donald Trump is back uh, at the White House and in fact he's back the US presidency and on expected lines the Fed went ahead and they cut the uh, rates back around 25 basis points. The problem is the FIs they continue to sell in the cash market and they're net short in the index futures but there's no signs of them covering those shots uh, at least as of now so we'll require a fresh trigger on that front. On in terms of a market range 23,800 to around 26,000 uh, you know 24,600 appears to be that range at 800 point range. We almost went to the 23,800 mark twice and we bounced off that. The problem is the FIs, guys. You know, they have uh, betrayed us. I mean, they just... <laughs> the last month, they sold close to $11 billion. That's even more than what they sold in the COVID month. The COVID month, it right. was around $8 billion or, or thereabouts. That was in March 2020. And who's offset all this FI selling? Well, you, the DIs. Indirectly, you have played a role out there because the DIs have pumped in close to around $12 billion. But what is this FBI selling? Is it just India? It is other uh, nations as well. Like Korea saw outflow of close to around three and a half uh, billion dollars, approximately. Uh, you had uh, Thailand that did see some bit of selling, and Taiwan was the lone uh, market that saw inflows from the FPIs. But otherwise, India's selling was much more than all these other, uh, you know, uh, countries. The major outflows that we saw were the financial and services, obviously because they have the largest holding out there. Oil and gas and consumables, as well as FMCG. While there were mild inflows coming in into metals chemicals as well as utilities. So it appears there's an element of that China rebound as well that's playing out, going by the flows in metals as well as chemicals. Uh, welcome to the show. First time on Editor's Roundtable. So let me uh, put that to you. Uh, why? why? Why all the selling? <laughs> well, thanks for the warm welcome with that word. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, frankly, I think it's quite puzzling even for me because I think uh, some of it seems... Uh, backward looking and some of it seems very sh very short-sighted um, backward looking because you know when I talk to some big FII's they will make the argument that look the S&P 500 has done really well in dollar terms why bother uh, looking at EM and I think what they miss there is that India should not actually be EM not because it's not emerging but because the fundamentals of the economy are completely different than most if not all other EM markets that it gets grouped into and frankly the performance of the index in dollar terms is very comparable to the S&P um, and better than the S&P in dollar terms if you exclude uh, the big seven tech companies so I right. find that argument that you know why bother to be a little bit backward looking I think the near the short term uh, view which is why I think you see this big number in October uh, other than just simply looking at, uh, you know, price to earnings ratio in China being so much lower and therefore saying we're going to reallocate uh, without understanding the structural issues that still exist there, um, is, is a real fact that near term earnings are really slowing down in India. And right. uh, the last two quarters of slowdown has been quite steep. I'm surprised more people are not focused on it. Um, I was, I think I was on your show right after the budget and... 
uh, I was a bit surprised that the budget focused so much on the fiscal deficit, uh, but not enough on, on spending. Um, I think you're seeing some of that uh, in terms of uh, uh, the slowing uh, earnings growth that is really coming across right. across. The you know, so there are two points to what you're saying. One, uh, you said that you are confused, so we're wondering whether you are selling or buying. And the second part, you said that when you speak to the big FII, so again, we're wondering whether you're not the big FII itself. Uh, but on both those points, you know, we, we'll come back to you. But the third point that you made on earnings itself, that being disappointing, well, Prashant's done some data crunching. Uh, Prashant, it's a season to forget. It's a season to forget, right? We can, and I hope we can forget it. And, uh, you know, uh, starting the next earnings season, we get uh, better tidings. But let me go across to the wall and uh, explain essentially what has happened, right? Uh, and this is the second quarter earnings season that we're looking at. And to the Chiefs point that some of this is backward looking data, so be sure this is backward looking. This is not third quarter, October to December. This is not forward looking. But this is, uh, you know, it does matter because what we're doing is we're looking at how earnings estimates for NIFT, NSE 200 companies, the most liquid companies in the market, have moved uh, for F525 based on Q2 beats and misses. How a full year estimates for these 200 companies really worked out. So the, date, the group set is this, uh, you know, 143 companies have reported so far. 10 out of these 143 companies have no earnings estimates available. Let's just go back to the first plate, please. 10 have no earnings estimates uh, available. So the data set is 133 companies. Out of 133 companies, 66% uh, of uh, these companies have seen EPS downgrades. I don't remember the last time we had such high uh, percentage of companies seeing downgrades. 27% companies have seen EPS upgrades and 7% uh, companies have seen no uh, changes to their EPS estimates at all. So let's quickly now work down to individual stocks and which are these companies which have seen the maximum downgrades. And I've sort of kind of largely tried to group these along with along sector lines. Look at the steel companies, JSW Steel, Tara Steel, JSPL. This is earnings estimates for the full year FI25 and how they've moved since the earnings season started and the earnings season is four weeks old. So this is, uh, you know, this is the, uh, this is the set. Uh, so steel, look at the next plate, please. IOC, HP, BP, anything between 8 and 25%. Uh, let's move along to power companies, right? Adani Green, JSW Energy, BHEL. Look at the downgrades here, 17 to 20%. Look at cement, 13%, uh, 11%, Ambuja, 7.5%, 8%. You look at some of these new age companies, Zomato, 15%. Sort of downtick to full year numbers, SBI cards, Indescent Bank, or some of the others. Uh, you know, Indigo has seen a 19% pull down to their full year estimates, SRF, APL Apollo. Uh, uh, then there's I mean, an assortment of other companies. Biocon, I was surprised. I don't, I'm not sure what happened here. But these are Bloomberg consensus numbers, Tata Communications, PV Fintech, Supreme Industries, DMART has seen a 10% downgrade to full year numbers, and there's Container Corporation as well. So, uh, and of course, on the, uh, on the flip side, this is the set. I mean, it's a short list here, but uh, GMR 9%, Hutco, PNB, Indus Tower, Dixon, Obra Realty, and Bharti Airtel. So that's what we've had. Shiv, uh, you, you said, I mean, uh, you know, that earnings have come off, and this, of course, is a pretty sad picture out there, and maybe things will improve in H2. Government spending will pick up, as many have pointed out. But do you think we are at that point where there has to be some fiscal help or monetary help? It doesn't look like we'll get any rate cuts anytime in the future, but what's your sense? I think, uh, you know, the data that you've just shared and what we see out here increasingly shows that this is a slope that's moving downward and it's not automatically going to just move in the other direction. Uh, it's quite clear monetary policy is very tight uh, and uh, you've seen the Fed cut rates by 75 basis points, 50 last time, 25 yesterday. Um, we in, in India, the rates haven't uh, moved at all uh, to the downside. So monetary policy is tight. Uh, fiscal policy seems tight. Uh, and earnings growth are, is slowing down materially. So I think without some of those levers moving, it's hard to see how this would uh, change in the near future. Uh, and, and just coming back to, you know, the earlier comment on uh, FII, I just want to clarify. I think the FIs that you'd find would be selling would still be those in the category of you know, looking at sort of trading uh, in and out of markets rather than those that have a multi-decadal view or a multi-year view. Um, because clearly in, in markets valued the way they are, where you can see the Nifty trading at low 20s times earnings, 
uh, or mid 20 time earnings, uh, slowing earnings the, this rapidly the way you just showed on the screen uh, will obviously cause uh, people to sell if they're being purely rational. Mm. Right, you know, Prashant, you spoke about uh, the entire earnings sector, uh, earnings performance uh, for the market at large. I'm looking at the consumer space and there were two that really confounded me because both of them saw decent growth in terms of performance. The stock price moves were very divergent and this happened in the last couple of days of the week. I'm talking about Trent and Page Industries. So let's let's talk about that, you know, tale of two cities. So if you look at um, the post earnings performance, you know, two days post earnings, Page Industries was up around 9% whereas Trent was down 8%. Was there any problem in the earnings for this kind of move or was there any positive surprise? Well, for Trent, the revenues grew 39%, EBITDA grew by 41% and uh, you had margin expansion, the net profit grew by 47%. For Page Industries as well, 11% revenue growth, 30% EPS growth. So, what exactly happened for these stock prices to move in these divergent ways? Well, there are three reasons. One, the stock price move in ahead of these numbers, expectations of what the street had and the market move. Let's talk about the stock price move itself. Preceding six months before the earnings, Page Industries was up just 28%, whereas Trent was up double of that, 56%. The last 12 months, Page Industries has actually been an underperformer, up just 17%, whereas Trent is up 183%. So, stock price move was one of the factors. The second, performance versus expectations. So, this is Bloomberg expectations and this is a CNBC TV18 poll. For Page Industries, the result versus expectations was up by about 19% on the revenue, 18% on the net profit. For Trent, uh, it was down 3% uh, on the revenue and down 22% on the net profit as compared to expectations despite growing 47% on the bottom line itself. And they were below their own five-quarter average for Trent as well. The last five-quarter, on an average, the revenue has grown 51%. This time around, due to muted consumer sentiment and perhaps a high base as well, grew just around 39%. For Page Industries, the last five-quarter average was a decline of 2%. So in that regard, an 11% growth seems like a far out performance itself. The third most important, market mood. In October, just a month ago, Trent was up 10% between October 7th and October 9th when the company announced a lab-grown diamond collection itself. Come to one month later, an EPS growth of 47% between November 7 and November 9 takes the stock price down by about 8%. Mild miss on elevated expectations. So that's telling you the di divergence in the market mood itself. The big question, where are the valuations now? For Page Industries, 67 times two-year forward earnings, Trent 95 times two-year forward earnings. Both of them not particularly cheap, but it's important to put the PE along with the growth as well. The expected EPS CAGR for Page Industries over the next couple of years is 19% and for Trent it is 55%. So if you look at it on a price to growth or the PEG ratio, Page Industries is three and a half times. We have uh, Trent at 1.7 times as well. Let's talk about the triggers for both and the risks. For Page Industries, the big triggers would be how they grow in e-commerce, tier two and tier three expansion, women's wear and at leisure are the couple of growth triggers for them. For Trent, it's an expansion of Zudio footprint, growth in the star format, seeding new platforms and perhaps some growth in lab grown as well. For both of them, common uh, risks, competition and consumer sentiment. So we'll watch out the trail of two cities, uh, two stocks, divergent numbers, divergent stock price moves, but similar expectations and similar uh, you know, risks. Uh, in fact, uh, let's go across to uh, Shiv. Shiv, you own Trent in your portfolio. What did you make? of these numbers and you know what exactly are you doing well again without commenting on what's in the portfolio or anything specific i think uh, uh with the company that you mentioned uh, trent and again this is no investment advice or uh, anything of that sort it is really important to keep in mind these numbers that they put in the context of weakening consumer spend so this is a retailer that has grown at 40 plus percent uh, in terms of top line and a consolidated numbers of earnings is, is up 50%. Um, in an environment where you see most consumer companies uh, struggling to grow single digit, mid single digits or high single digits. Um, so these are the two, uh, you know, I think that's important to keep that context in terms of how they did when the overall environment was a little bit weak. Okay, uh, Shiv, hold that thought. We will slip into a very short break. We'll come back, continue our conversation. We'll also get your view in on the technology sector. Well, that was the only marquee outperformer this week.
Hi guys, you're watching Editor's Roundtable. It was a tough week for our markets. We gave up nearly 1% at the index level. But one stock, I'm sorry, one sector stood out and that's IT. The Nifty IT index soared nearly 4.5% this week. I spoke to a few analysts and they're saying that IT perhaps is now seen as a US macro play. Uh, because this cut, the potential cut in US corporate taxes opens up space for budget increases and maybe discretionary spending also comes back. And if you remember, in Trump 1.0, in his earlier term, IT had underperformed because of restrictive immigration policy. H-1B visa rejection rates went up. Uh, but that time, the IT industry was caught unprepared. And this time, in the last eight years, they have increased their localization. So according to analysts, the localization, that is the number of uh, you know, employees that they hire in the U.S., uh, stands at more than 70%. So even if there are adverse restrictive immigration policies, it's not likely to hurt the Indian IT companies because they are well prepared. So on the positive, you've got a potential for discretionary spending coming up because America is perhaps going to become great again. And plus on the sidelines, the rupee depreciation that we've seen over the last two days is also positive for the margins of IT companies. Uh, Shiv, so come in. Uh, does Is there a case to increase allocation to technology? Technology is not performed. Uh, and now, even in the Q2 earnings, we did see green shoots in BFSI recovering. So all in all, would you go out there and increase your allocation to tech? Well, I'd say IT services this week, uh, you know, not, is, you know, has done well in addition to what you said also because it's viewed as a defensive. And when some of the other sectors were selling off, there was capital perhaps rotating out there. Uh, I'm going to mention two points, which I think are really interesting from a structural perspective on IT services. So without commenting on what's going to happen this quarter or next quarter. Uh, number one, uh, historically, it's never been a great macro play on the U.S. economy. It's been actually the opposite when companies are looking to cut costs and they want to move uh, their budgets uh, or through migration uh, work. A lot of that has come to IT services. And the number two point I'll make is that if you heard the earnings calls from uh, the big cloud vendors like Amazon and Google, um, you know, Google mentioned on their last earning call that 25% of all the code that's written at Google was done through AI. Um, Amazon mentioned that they, up, they migrated 36,000 applic uh, uh, applications, which would normally take hundreds of developer years in the quarter using AI. Um, and when you talk to them offline, you know, they've got very big plans in terms of what they're going to do uh, regarding taking some of that development in-house using AI. So I'm not sure, quite sure what the implications are, but I think it's going to be very interesting once this current migration work is over, which is getting the data ready for Fortune 500 companies to get them ready for AI, and we are into that. What does this mean? longer term for IT services question, uh, companies. I think that's a that's a very big question. Mm. Uh, Shiv, you've uh, believed in own private financial names here for a long time. I mean, it's not a new kind of bet for you, uh, but, uh, and they did very well, uh, and then they did not do uh, so well for a few years. Uh, but is the time here now for private financials, valuation-wise and, of course, I mean, actually largely valuation-wise, because everything else is so expensive and maybe there's a bit of an earnings deceleration elsewhere as well. Well, a couple of things happening in financials, right? In the last one year, you've seen how tight uh, monetary policy has been. Um, and uh, with a lot of money moving into the equity markets from domestic retail, uh, you know, you've, there's been pressure on gathering low-cost deposits for some of the financial institutions. Uh, but if you, in the last quarter, that was changing. And you could see some of the big banks uh, growing their deposit bases quite healthily. Um, I think the interesting thing in financial services is that the larger banks and the larger, more well-run NBFCs uh, will now see an increasingly better time uh, in the coming 12 months. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Number one, you saw in the last year and a half or two years, a lot of lenders come into the market, in, especially in the unsecured space. Um, and you saw the RBI also come down and, and get concerned about it. And what you're seeing right now is the impact of all of that lending. But the bigger lenders uh, were a lot more cautious. And the largest bank was a lot more cautious. And if you see what they're doing now, now they're talking about over the next 12 months, uh, increasing their exposure to that space 
as the data changes. And this is very typical. This has happened over cycles, uh, which is why the big companies in, in financials don't change and they get stronger with each cycle. I think the second thing is that I think monetary policy will ease, ease in, it will loosen, sorry, over the next uh, uh, couple of quarters. Um, and if that happens and liquidity in the system goes up, that's another benef benefit to the financial sector. Shiv, thank you very much for your insight. Um, enjoy your weekend. And with that, folks, it's a wrap on this week's uh, broadcast. Thank you very much for watching. But next week's a big one, right? First, it's the last of the earnings season. And then we've got a very special Global Leadership Summit. But till then, thank you for watching the show. Enjoy your weekend and stay with CNBC TV 18 for more news and updates.